Hello, this is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk about the best recordings of Bruckner's Seventh Symphony. Now, this is one of the two most popular Bruckner symphonies, the other being the fourth, the Romantic Symphony. But the seventh is better. It's a better symphony all the way through. It has several very, very unique features, however, that make it somewhat difficult to interpret, I think. It poses some challenges. The most obvious one is the fact that, structurally speaking, it consists of two huge, long, slowish movements, followed by two short, quicker ones. So it's it's horrendously front-loaded. I mean, quite literally, you know, the last two movements can total about 20 minutes. The first two total double that, at least, maybe more, 45 minutes. It usually lasts between like 65, 70 minutes, something like that. So, you know, it, it's so important, so, so important to preserve a certain sense of momentum going through the entire work, especially in those first two movements. The first movement and the adagio have to be contrasted somehow. The best way to do it probably is in the first movement to allow for some flexibility of pulse between its three main subjects so that it has contrast and a little bit more um, you know, dramatic shall we say, I mean, nothing in Bruckner is really dramatic, but has a, a, cer a certain amount of, of, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. How would you describe it? You're all Bruckner people. You tell me how you describe it. The music flows so, it's a luminous movement and none of it moves very quickly, but there are rhythmic contrasts and timbral contrasts and textural contrasts, and those need to be emphasized a little bit so that the first movement sounds like it has more variety than the adagio, which only has two subjects, but the greatest climax in the history of symphonic music, probably. So, you know, that's, that's kind of one problem. Um, the other issue with the symphony, I think, is one of, of making sure that the brass section doesn't completely overwhelm everyone else all the time. You know, in the eighth, Bruckner finally switched to triple wins in the ninth also to give the textures a little bit better balance. But in the seventh, he's still dealing with double wins, but he's got four horns, four Wagner tubas, three trumpets, three trombones in a tuba. I once saw Schulte in Chicago do it where he used five trumpets. I mean, you couldn't hear anything except the brass section. And what a glorious brass section it is. I mean, it's magnificent, but, but you know, there has to be, there has to be a certain sensibility in the way the brass are handled so that they don't always overwhelm everything whenever they're playing. And also the music itself has, you know, a, a certain luminosity and inner glow, which Bruckner achieves by very simple, but very impressive means. I'll, I'll give you one example. The first movement has no timpani whatsoever until the low E that begins the coda. And then it's the longest roll in the history of symphonic music. It's like three and a half minutes of solid, gradual crescendo, day crescendo, and then crescendo again. It's a fabulous, fabulous, subtle orchestral touch because, because there's no timpani, the melodies seem to float. The whole movement has a weightlessness, even though it contains some very, very heavy music and never moves very quickly. You know, and of course, the adagio similarly has no timpani at all in the original version. If you add them at the climax, I mean, it's just that one moment. And then in the scherzo, they finally get to go bump it on, bump it on, bump it on, very little. And the finale, you're back to the texture of the first movement. You do have a couple of quiet rolls and then a big one at the end. But basically, Bruckner's scoring keeps the whole edifice somehow suspended in midair, it seems, weightless. And conductors have to be conscious of that. They have to be aware of the fact that the music has to sort of have this, this inner light. It has to glow and float. I mean, this is probably the most obviously spiritual uh, of Bruckner symphonies. And spirituality in music is actually a very seriously misunderstood topic. There are two ways that conductors achieve spirituality. One is by, by 
playing music that we associate with worship, for example, chorales, you know, prayerful music that we say, oh, it sounds like in a church. That's spiritual because of our associations, our external associations with it. But the real way that music becomes spiritual is to write music which is suprahuman. In other words, most music, most instruments are vocally based and the music that composers write for them is vocally based and it moves at a human pace and the melodies operate in human terms on a human time scale. But if you negate those qualities, if you use instruments in a non-vocal or super vocal way, I mean, for example, this is why choral music is considered spiritual quite often and used in, in worship because communal singing is a superhuman voice. The voice of God is a chorus. It's not one guy, you know, singing a song. You know what I mean? Remember my little chat about leader, about songs? No, it's got to be on a completely different scale. And when we hear that, we automatically recognize it as something that is bigger than human. Now, if it has no melodies, if it's purely textural, you wind up with space music. You get whole the planets, music which is non-vocal, but which is rhythmic and textural and all that stuff. It doesn't, it doesn't have a tune. But if it does have a tune, but that tune is either very, very, very slow or presented in close harmony or in close counterpoint or in some way to suggest the multitude in a way, then you wind up with music that we will quite often associate with spirituality simply because of its non-vocal nature. And Bruckner was an absolute master of that, and he is nowhere more a master of it than in the Seventh Symphony. But that's the other problem with the Seventh Symphony, because the first two movements are full of that kind of elevated spiritual quality, that non-vocal but extremely lyrical, songful and incredibly beautiful music. Um, the climax of the slow movement is, you know, the acme of all of this and the coda of the first movement, which is actually sort of you know, a rewrite of the introduction to Das Rheingold, the prelude to Das Rheingold by Wagner, but in Brucknerian terms. And it's also completely superhuman music. It's, it's just incredible. But then you have the last two movements and they can be such an anticlimax. This is such a problem that some of you may recall Colin Davis recorded the, disc li the, the symphony live on Orfeo, you know, one of the red Orfeo live ones where he switched the uh, orders of the scherzo and the adagio because it, you know, I mean, it was a horrible thing to do and completely unnecessary. But that's one of the outcomes of the fact that the expression and the intensity of the first two movements is so different from the last two. And they can seem to be on a much lower level. All of this is resolvable in a great performance. So I want to talk about the great performances. The only other issue we need to talk about textually is the famous cymbal crash and triangle roll and timpani thing at the climax of the adagio. I have to say straight out, I don't care whether it's there or not. I don't think it matters. I mean, it's a few seconds out of the whole work. So, you know, who really cares? However, I do think that the symphony, uh, that the cymbal and triangle crash help a bit. There's a hilarious YouTube video. I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, I I will try and find it and stick it at the description of this video that has that has the uh, you know what happens to a percussionist who has some issues with the single cymbal crash and triangle roll. You've got two guys. They sit there. They read Scientific American. I mean, I saw one guy doing that during a performance of Bruckner's Seventh. And you get up there and you better not miss your single moment. But for me, in, in my opinion, the, the inauthentic moment is not the symbol and triangle roll. It's the timpani, the timpani part, because Bruckner never would have written um, on his own. I mean, he wrote the parts in, so he wrote them. Um, but I don't think he would have written the tonic and dominant exchanges for timpani underneath that climax, which go on for a very long time. You know, it's dun, 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 boom, boom. You know, he's like, dun, dun. He never does that. He would have written a single tonic roll that would go on for several bars and stop, and that would have been it. I really think that's what the timpani part would have looked like had it been Bruckner's original idea. But be that as it may, he put them in. Somebody wrote not valid later. There's a whole controversy about it. 
Life is too short. If the performance is great, it's going to be great whether the symbols are there or not. And so that is the end of our discussion of textural issues in Bruckner's Seventh Symphony. There are other differences um, in terms of uh, performance indications between the Haas and Novak scores, the two main scores. Um, there were some subsequent uh, tempo emendations in various places, and some conductors pay attention to them and some people don't. They don't make any difference. Let's talk about the recordings, shall we? I have one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, about 10 of them here. And I think that's plenty. I know there are more. I know you have a favorite. You'll tell me what it is, I'm sure. The fact that I don't mention it doesn't mean it isn't good or that I don't like it or didn't care. These are the 10 that I turn to most often that I think are the most worthy. And the first and one of the oldest, maybe the oldest is Hans Rosebaud. This is the huge Korean Hans Rosebaud box, but it's also in the Hans Rosebaud Bruckner box that SWR has produced, um, which is also quite quite marvelous in certain places. Rosebud was one of those conductors. Everything he did has this effortless flow. It's organic. It's coherent. Everything is balanced and weighted properly. His recording originally came out on Vox. It was a cheapy, cheapy, cheapy Bruckner 7th. And it was my first one because it was cheap. It was like a dollar, a dollar 99. And it broke the adagio over two sides. It was on one disc and it sounded lousy but it's been remastered, it sounds fine, and it's a, an absolutely beautiful performance. Next up, I would say, is Klemp, Otto Klemperer. I, I love Klemperer at Bruckner, I mean, mostly. I mean, his, his eighth, he cuts and does weird things. The fifth, was he was too late in his life, maybe. But his great Bruckner, four, six, and seven, are as good as anybody's out there. And in the seventh, he achieves a really special sort of balance between the various parts because the adagio is a little quicker than usual. It's 21 minutes. The first movement's 19. And the finale, because Klemper at this point in his life didn't do anything quickly, um, is a little slower than usual. So the result has a very nice sense of balance between all the parts of the symphony. It doesn't sound as top heavy as it usually does. And for that reason, I think it's a very interesting performance to hear and very, very worthwhile. Also marvelous, Georg Tintner on Naxos. This is an absolutely first class seventh. It's with the Royal Scottish National Symphony Orchestra, which has a glorious brass section. And you know, they play beautifully. And Tintner had, I think, a very special feeling for the Bruckner Seventh. It's 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 a wonderful, wonderful performance um, in beautiful sound. And it's interesting to hear it played by an orchestra, which is not, you know, the usual Bruckner orchestra. You know, the strings are not as weighty, but it, it doesn't hurt in this symphony because as usual with Bruckner, you know, the melody is almost never in the violins, right? The opening is for cellos. Then you've got the Wagner tubas in the adagio. There's the beautiful violin melody, which is the second subject of the adagio. But basically, basically the violins are always playing tremolos and accompaniments and ostinatos and things like that. And even in the finale, where they, they get to do a little bit more, everything is, is tremolo-y, it's light, it's airy. You don't need a huge weight of string sonority, except in the adagio. And although the Scottish orchestra doesn't have that Vienna, Berlin weight of sonority, they do have the brass section. So it works really well. And Tintner's pacing is, is, is absolutely spot on. It's a beautifully thought out performance. However, I'm very interested in Bruckner that doesn't take forever. I mean, one of the reasons, for example, I think that Celebidaki's Bruckner 7th is just lousy for the most part is because it's just too damn slow. The symphony has enough slow music. It's mostly slow music. Aside from the scherzo, you cannot let it drag the way Celebidaki does. I mean, it's interesting because the same approach that he uses works very well in the eighth. Why? Because the first movement is also slowish. It's a moderato, allegro, a moderato or something like that. But but then you get the scherzo and then the adagio and then the quick finale. It's a whole different kettle of beans. And if you want to stretch it out to unconscionable length, you can get away with it in the eighth. 
You can't get away with it in the seventh. You just can't. However, there are a couple performances that go the opposite way, that play the whole thing very quickly. They get it done in under an hour. And you know what? It sounds marvelous that way. It can anyway. I mean, there was, you know, Ivan Fisher on Channel Classics. I, I, he does it, and I don't think it works very well at all, frankly. But Edward von Bynum with the Concertgebouw, absolutely a first-class Bruckner, Bruckner Seventh. This is 58 minutes. It's beautiful because it has that flow all the way through. It never sounds too fast. It never sounds hasty. It just it just flows effortlessly and it works it works splendidly also a performance that probably most of you will not have thought about or care about was Ormandy in Philadelphia he's even a little quicker I think he gets it done in about 56 minutes I mean this recording has Brahms' Haydn variations this is a coupling which tells you how it moves but wow first of all he's got Philadelphia playing magnificently this is one of his great recordings from his RCA period. He didn't do it before for Sony, for Columbia. And it's magnificent. The, the, the playing of the strings in the second subject of the Adagio is, is to, it's just to die for. It's so, so beautiful. It has all that richness and sonority you might want, like from Berlin, you know, with Carrion, but because of, because of the fact that it's, it's moving at a goodly clip, it, it never sounds too heavy. It doesn't bog down. It, there's there's articulation. It has rhythm. It's not it's not all legato sludge. You know what I mean? It's a great performance. It's an absolutely great performance, and it again never sounds rushed. If you're used to the really slow ones, it will come as a total shock. But I really, really strongly recommend that you hear it because Ormandy was uh, a wonderful conductor in some of this music, and his Bruckner is a really one of the best kept secrets out there i mean his fourth and fifth are terrific the seventh is terrific it's it's uh it's a lesson for people who misjudge him and think they know what he was about next we do have to talk about carrion i like this performance very much this is his last one and it's with vienna not with berlin and i think that's why it's so great because it's with vienna not that the berlin ones are bad i mean there were there were a couple of them I, you know, there was the Deutsche Grammophon one, which was quite good, and the EMI one, which sounds like it was recorded in a cave and had four bars missing from the second subject of the finale, although I think they put them back in the most recent mastering. I never liked the performance. I couldn't be bothered to check or to care. But his last recording, this was, I think, his last ever recording. Doesn't it say that here or something like that? It'll say something. Yes. Yes, it says it's the Let's to Aufnahme, his last ever recording. And a beautiful valedictory and testimony to a, a great musician, really. It really is. It's it's lovely. It's lovely and, and heartfelt and warm. And because I think Vienna is uh, involved here, it has just enough extra sonority and texture and variety that it's not overly smooth or overly blended. It's very close to Klemper's. It's a couple of minutes slower in the Adagio, but otherwise the timings are very, very similar. It's Quite interesting that way. Next, Gunter Wand with Berlin. If you want the Berlin Philharmonic, this is the one to get. Yes, there's no cymbal crash. I'm sorry for those of you who are great cymbal aficionados and triangle roll and timpani. Wand never did it. He uses the Haas edition, but it's gloriously played. And it's, it's Gunter Wand. It's full of all of those sensitivities of texture and balance and, and you know, counterpoint and clarity that make his performances so so wonderful I mean just everything tells everything sounds beautifully effortless and natural and there are just just moments in in both the first and second movements where you, you'll hear things that you've never heard before just because of the weight of texture it's it's a it was a marvelous conductor and he got it because he worked harder you know it was he rehearsed like crazy he didn't care if they knew the music he made them learn it fresh and it sounds like it he got them to play in a fresh way as though they're discovering the music for the first time these are great great performances not all of his berlin ones were as great sometimes his ndr performances were better than the berlin ones that was the case in the eighth but not in the seventh and not in the fourth so uh, I recommend them very, very highly. Next, High Tink and the Concertgebouw. Now this 
is his second one from uh, 1978, I think is when this was recorded, right around there. He's the, the one that comes in the box was early and it's it's really underplayed. It's it's one of those early sort of high tink, the shy, bashful, not terribly charismatic conductor. And then, of course, he remade some of them in digital, the eighth and the ninth, and they didn't sound, the ninth wasn't bad, the eighth sounded dreadful. Um, the seventh he remade just before a digital recording came out, which was great because the initial Phillips digital sounded like crap. But here they finally figured out how to record in the concert about, they did a gorgeous job and it's a beautiful performance. This has the cymbal crash. It's one of the most incandescent climaxes of the Adagio you are ever going to hear. It's, it's absolutely glorious. And of course, he's a great Bruckner conductor. They're a great Bruckner orchestra. You really do need to have some Concertgebouw in your life when you get to the Bruckner Seventh Symphony. Um, we have two more, and then we're going to be done with this survey. One of the great Bruckner Sevenths that blew everyone away when it came out. It was a shocker. Shai, with the Deutsches Radio Symphony Berlin, or the whatever, Deutsches Symphony Orchestra Berlin, or the Berlin Radio, whatever that thing was in those days. And it was splendid. Shayu was in charge of it. We thought, I remember when it first came out, and it struck us as a rather slow performance. It actually isn't. It's slow in places where slowness matters. And I'm talking about like the coda of the first movement, the climax of the adagio. He holds back and lets it build, and it's, ah, it's glorious. And the climax at the end of the finale, too. Because, you know, one of the problems, uh, you know, with doing that finale is that, you know, the coda of the finale is the same as the coda of the first movement, only less. <laughs> and so it can sound terribly anticlimactic unless you build it very, very carefully and take your time and let it do its thing. And Shai does. And this was, you know, one of the performances that really sort of told everybody that he was a real, a real, the real article, a real up and comer, a major conductor that Bruckner said that it's held up very, very well. It's very well recorded. It's a gorgeous performance. However, if I had to pick one, if I had to select my Bruckner Seventh, the be all and end all of Bruckner Seventh, I would pick Joachim and the Staatskapelle Dresden. There are two main reasons. One is that Joachim really, really understands how to pace this piece. The first movement has a lot of internal variety, but it flows beautifully. It never sounds incoherent or overly sectional, but the adagio, ah, oh, the adagio. This is the adagio to die for. This is the one, very slow, very intense, hushed. If you believe in that spiritual quality, you'll find it here like nowhere else. I, I guarantee it. It is superb. And the Staatskapelle Dresden is just the orchestra to do it. I mean, they have just the right sound. They have an inherent sort of transparency, luminosity, and lightness of texture. You hear it in things like in the Savala Schumann symphonies. They, they naturally play that way. They have the right sonority for this symphony. And with Joachim, they had the ideal conductor for it. And then in the last two movements, he's got them paced in such a way that you really almost, you almost hear the symphony in three parts. That, so it balances, you know what I mean? The last two movements kind of form a, a unit. And so you have this big first movement, this big adagio, and then this sort of dual thing at the end. And the whole thing just comes across as a, a glowing moment of musical ecstasy, right? And that's what you want in Bruckner Seventh. And Joachim in the Staatskapelle Dresden is your guy. I absolutely guarantee it. So that is my take on the Bruckner Seventh. Now, I know, as I said, there are many others. I mean, there was the, the late Giolini, which was very beautiful. There were, I don't know, there was a fabulous Kurt Sanderling live recording from SWR that I really, I could very easily include here. Uh, you, you'll, you'll, mention the other ones that you enjoy. But I think I think that these these 10 or so give you uh, the best overview of all the things that you can do with the music legitimately. I mean, that make it sound best. 
and show you the range of interpretive options in what is unquestionably Bruckner's most spiritually glowing and gorgeous, lyrically beautiful and effusive symphony. So thank you so much. Keep on listening, folks. Take care.